On the mountain where I live in Malaysia, uh, we have an abundance of monkeys, and I love to go for walks. It's my daily routine to go for a walk, clear my brain, and get ready for teaching. And I remember one time I was walking down our mountain when I saw a troop of monkeys jumping through the forest. Now, maybe it will surprise you, but monkeys can jump a long way. I mean, a monkey that well, I don't know if you can even see it on camera, but a monkey would have no trouble to jump from here all the way to the far end of that piano and even further. Monkeys can just really move. But when monkeys jump a long distance like that, they don't jump from level to level. They always lose altitude. That is, they jump and they land. But what that means, if you're into physics, what it means is that they have a vertical uh, momentum. Uh, they're falling. And when they land on that next branch, that branch really bends. And then if all is well, it kind of re-bends and they shake a little bit and they're good. But it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes they land, it bends and breaks. And when I say sometimes, I don't mean like once a week or once a month. I mean like several times a day per monkey. The jungle is just littered with broken branches just all over the place. It just happens. And monkeys don't worry about it because they never aim for the lowest branch on a tree. So when that monkey, when that branch bends and breaks, well, it absorbed a certain amount of their momentum they just let go of that falling piece of dead wood and catch the next branch on the way down. And it's, it's, just, it's not a panicky situation for them. So I was watching them going. Unfortunately for the monkeys, someone was maintaining the road I was on. And as part of their maintenance, they had cut all the branches to quite a high level on the trees, you know, on one side of the trees. And when that monkey jumped over the road, and grabbed his branch, and the branch broke, he put out his hands to grab another, and there was no other. And down, 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 down came the monkey, hitting the ground hard. And I thought he might die, maybe just be terribly injured. He didn't even take time to brush himself off. As soon as he hit the ground, he stood up and he ran to a tree and made himself safe. Now let me ask you, why would a monkey not at least take a breather? Why not at least stand there for a minute and just check for a concussion feeling? Why not just sit there and think, man, what can I learn from this? Why just get up and go? Well, you might know if you've been listening for a while, it's because we have dogs. And the dogs don't think that it's polite to give a monkey time on the ground. They figure if the monkey gets within a meter of the ground, he's fair game. And so there's no time for monkeys to sit. Well, I'm talking to you not about monkeys, but about you, because truthfully, you all are going to fall. I don't, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a son of a prophet, I just think you look mighty human-like. And so I suppose it's gonna happen. Let me show you the idea in the Bible. Look at Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. And we're looking at verse 16. Proverbs 24, verse 16. I feel right at home. It feels like I'm in a classroom. I see four people taking notes. 
Proverbs 24, 16 says, for a just man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked will fall into mischief. So let me see if you read it the same way I do. Suppose that just man falls eight times. How many times do you think he'll get up? That's the idea, isn't it? The difference between a just man and an unjust man is that the unjust man gets up one less time than he falls down. Do you understand the idea? The just man is the one who falls and rises. He gets up again. So when you've sinned, how long need you be guilty? Not long. You don't need to go a day before you make things right. You don't need to go for a week. If you fall into sin, you don't need to, for three months, be lost along the way. I had a student, maybe a decade ago, maybe longer, and he came to me one day and, and he just looked stressed and sweating. And he wanted to talk to me about something and it shocked me. He told me that he had visited a prostitute. This was a young man studying to be a missionary. That's what he'd been aiming for for a year and a half already. He had been in the world, he had become a Christian, Right away, he had decided to go give his life into full-time ministry. He had been studying with me for over a year. But you know, in his worldly life, he had seen prostitutes. That was before he was a Christian. And just this week, he had been in town and uh, had picked up a hitchhiker that was a prostitute. And, well, his better judgment did not keep him under control and he ended up seeing her. And he felt so terrible guilty, he thought that he had committed something like the unpardonable sin, like he should drop out of school, like he might as well just go live a worldly life, like it was all over and done. And he wanted to know what I thought about it, but I wasn't his first stop. His first stop had been the police station he thought maybe they'd arrest him. He was just gonna confess his crime. And he told them that he had visited a prostitute and they laughed at him. And uh, he asked if he was in trouble and they said the punishment for that is a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, we don't do anything about that here. Uh, you can go on your way. Uh, that was his first stop and uh, I was the second. His name is David. He's a missionary today. What I said to him is that just men fall. Do you see that there in Proverbs 24? Just men fall and the issue isn't whether you fall, it's whether you get up. That's the issue. It's whether you repent and make things right. You kneel down and admit that what you did was wrong and say you, you're not gonna do it again, or at least you choose not to do it again, you're turning away from that. Well, David had turned away from it before he came to talk to me. He had turned away from it before he went to the police station. Today, I wanna study with you about mercy. Mercy is a topic that is beautiful, there's truth in it, and there's certainly an abuse of it by those who would like to turn the grace of God into an opportunity to do whatever they'd like to do. Uh, let's begin our study by going to Romans chapter two. Romans chapter two. Romans chapter two, and we're going to look at verse three. Romans two, verse three says, and do you think this, O man, the one that judges them that do such things, when you do the same, that you will escape the judgment of God. Maybe verse three needs some context. I won't read you chapter one, verses 29 to 32, but if you'll look there, you'll see a long list of evil behaviors. You'll see adultery and covetousness, 
murder and being despiteful and being proud and boasters and disobedient and unthankful and unholy generally. Just a lot of evil things. Among those evil things up there, you'll see the very last one in verse 31. What's the last one in verse 31, 131? Unmerciful. What Paul says is when you point the finger and are apt to get on someone's case and to make them feel their guilt, when you're like that, you are guilty of the same list of sins that they are. Not the same sin. They might be guilty of being an adulterer. You're guilty of being unmerciful, but it's the same category. I mean, it's the same group. And what does it say about those things? Chapter one, verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of what? Worthy of death. But still, not only do they do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Certainly there's a a large number of people that enjoy to hang out with sinners. I don't mean for the sake of raising them higher, but for the sake of enjoying their company. But you might be surprised when I say that some churches are one of the, some churches are a group of people hanging out for the purpose of talking about other people. That is, they're unmerciful. And uh, what do we read in Romans 2, 3? It said, Do you think this, O man, that judges them which does such things and does the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Look at verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance? Do you know that big word forbearance? That's when you don't like something, but you put up with it anyway. And what it says about God is he has a wealth of that. He's wealthy in forbearance. Do you despise his forbearance and his long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Well, there's a, a beautiful formula. I would like to repent what is it that leads me to repentance? Oh, that's the goodness of God, but only under condition. It's the goodness of God when I let it inside of me. Not when I despise it, but when I let it fill me. What Paul says here, I'm putting my own words on it, but I think you'll see it if you read it. He's saying that if you only love the mercy of God, but you don't let it flow through you, you're not going to receive the mercy of God. But if you think that's not what he means, I'll just tell you Jesus said that quite clearly. He said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. But James said it, the other side of that coin, James 2, he said, for he shall have judgment without mercy who has shown no mercy. It's the other side of that same idea. Paul says, when you're judgmental, when you're harsh, when you're unmerciful, are you despising God's mercy to you? In other words, if God is showing mercy to you and you appreciate that, how can you not show mercy to someone else? Jesus talked about this same issue in a parable. You probably remember the parable. That was the parable of that man that forgave the tremendous debt and then his forgiven debtor went and held someone accountable for a small debt. You remember how the parable ends? It ends with the forgiven debt being unforgiven. Something people would say, God forbid. It can't be. Why, that can't be real. But it's in the parable. In the parable, the debt is forgiven and then it's extracted. Because you ought to show mercy. Jesus said immediately after that little prayer he taught us, the one we say the Lord's Prayer, Immediately after you pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, he explained that if you do not forgive your debtors, you will not receive forgiveness for your debts. Have you read that there in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6? It's just a very clear idea that mercy needs to go all the way to the inside. It needs to go in and be there. We can't have it just externally. In a previous talk, I was speaking about depression. And when I talked about depression, 
I talked about its causes and some of the triggers. And one of the triggers I mentioned is that trigger of when a child has been wronged, uh, either by being abandoned or molested or something related to one of those ideas. There is an early trigger that can cause decades of hurt and pain and struggle and disaster. Just a terrible thing to happen. I wish it didn't, but it surely does and surely has and surely is happening today somewhere in New Zealand. I want to speak a little more about what happens later in life when finally the mind is ready to deal with the trauma. What happens there is the mind, often a young lady or young man will have flashbacks at that point. Not always, but it does happen to many people. They'll end up seeing and remembering things that they tried not to think about for a long time. One thing I would counsel there as a way of letting the mercy of God inside of you is to begin to do what I call merciful thinking. And let me walk you through what I mean by merciful thinking. So here you have your father. Oh, let's not make him the perpetrator. Here you have your cousin. He's the one who's done something so terrible. You could think about him like this. You could think that evil, you won't think this when you're seven, but you might think it when you're 20. That evil, terrible, rotten, I just wish he would die. I hope he dies a painful death. I wish someone would just gouge out his eyes and make him feel that you could talk that way to yourself. But let me tell you another way you could talk. You could say, if he had been raised the right way, if he hadn't had the background he had, if he hadn't suffered when he was a child, if he had had two good solid parents that were just as good in the home as they were in church, I say that if because you might think he did have two good solid parents, but I'm saying you don't really know that. There's a lot of people who look better at church than they do inside the home. But if he had been raised just the right way, it's very likely he wouldn't have made the same decisions. I'm not saying when I think this way that what he did is okay. I'm not saying he shouldn't be in prison for 50 years. I'm not saying that he's not guilty. But I'm saying that there are influences that push people in a right direction or a wrong direction. And part of merciful thinking is recognizing that he wasn't born in the Garden of Eden. Do you understand what I'm saying? To recognize that there were pressures pushing him and that maybe if all those same pressures pushed on me, maybe I wouldn't be much better than him. Maybe I wouldn't be any better than him. And just admitting that to yourself really creates a different set of feelings than the vindictive, angry, judgmental feelings that are a natural revenge effect. What I'm trying to say is mercy on the inside is so much more pleasant. Let me show you in the Bible where you can find this kind of mercy. Look at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 has an almost unbelievable verse. We're going to look down at verse 17. Acts chapter 3, and looking at verse 17. Let's start in verse 16, just because it's good for us. And his name, that is Jesus, through faith in his name, faith in Jesus, has made this man strong. You might remember the man, the one that begged for a long time there in the porch of the temple. Whom you see and know, yes, the faith which is by Jesus has given this man perfect soundness in the presence of you all. That was a hard thing to say to the Jews. But he finishes it. Look at verse 17. And now, brothers, I know, that's what what means, it means no. And now, brethren, I know that through ignorance you did it. Not many of us would be so nice as to say that. I know that you killed Jesus through ignorance. 
I mean, if you were one of the apostles, you might be inclined to say it different. I know that you watched his miracles for three and a half years. You never caught him doing anything wrong. I know you sensed the power of the Spirit on your life when you heard him speaking and you still killed him. Do you hear the difference between these two? But what Peter says is, I know through ignorance you did it. But certainly we would not go the second mile that he does in verse 17. He said, as also did what? Your rulers. We would not give the mercy to the rulers like that. Why, anti-Semitism has often grown a thousand years or 1500 years or 2000 years after the death of Jesus because of this grace not even existing today. That is, here's Peter saying, I know that you personally did it in ignorance and your rulers personally did it in ignorance. And here's the anti-Semite saying, your great, 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 great grandfathers did a terrible wicked thing and you ought to suffer. Do you hear just the direct opposite in those two ways of thinking? One is merciful thinking and the other is judgmental thinking. Judgmental thinking is really self-disastrous because he shall have judgment without mercy who hath shown no mercy. But merciful thinking is powerful. One of the shocking things in Acts is this beautiful phrase, a great company of the priests believed. Has anyone here ever read that in the book of Acts that can witness that it's there? Well, that's just amazing. And what you're reading here in Acts 3.17 is part of the formula that leads to that beautiful result. It's a different way of thinking. I know through ignorance. What does ignorance have to do with it? We'll come back to that, but look right now at Titus chapter 3. Titus, all your T's are together. So if you find Timothy or Thessalonians, you know you're close to Titus. Titus chapter three, and we'll come to verse three, a verse that helps us understand how practically to relate to fallen people. For we also ourselves were sometimes foolish. Have you ever met someone who's foolish? Someone who's like disobedient? Someone who's deceived? What about someone who's serving their lusts and their pleasures or a variety of pleasures and lusts? Have you ever met anyone like that? Uh, Listen to how Paul describes himself, you and I. We also were sometimes deceived, excuse me, foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures We were living in malice and envy. We were hateful and hating one another. Do you see the mercy in verse three? Merciful thinking? What am I doing? Am I thinking of myself as being a notch above the sinner? Or do I recognize I was in the very same boat? Well, I was in the same boat. Maybe I'm still a notch above because maybe I jumped out of the boat. But look at how we got out of the boat in verse four. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Verse four doesn't say that God began to love us. He loved us before we did wrong. But what does verse four say? We saw it. It came to our attention. Somehow, the love of God appeared to us. We know that Jesus died for us. We knew it, but we, someone helped us think it through. Or maybe we saw it in action in a, in a person. Somehow that love appeared to us. That's what makes the difference. You were foolish, you were disobedient, you were deceived, you were serving lust and pleasures, you were living in malice, you were envying, you were hateful. That was your experience, and then you saw the love of God, and that changed everything. But what is this passage saying? It's telling you what to do when you meet someone who's foolish and disobedient, deceived and serving various lusts and pleasures, someone who's living in malice, someone who's hateful and hating maybe you. What might make a difference for a person like that according to verse four? What might do it? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be when the love of God shows up? It's when they can see it. It's when it's in front of their face. That's what likely would do it. At least it did it for someone. 
Verse 5 just lets you know that it certainly wasn't because you were better than the other people in the boat that you got out. That wasn't it. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. He did that by washing and remaking us, renewing us by the Holy Ghost. I just paraphrased verse 5. What does verse 5 say? It says that we were not the goody ones and that's why we received mercy. On the contrary, we saw the mercy and that's how he cleaned us up. We saw the mercy and that made an opportunity for him to make a new heart in us, to do something worked by his Holy Spirit and to change what was so it's not that way anymore. But you might not be Pentecostal, but it might be a good time to say hallelujah. Right? Isn't that a beautiful thing? That's the mercy of God in action. But the passage, the Bible as a whole, and this passage in particular, indicates that the mercy of God is best visible when it comes through you. That's where it shows up best, when you show it. And then it's most obscured when you hold people accountable as if you're the one who's responsible to do it. I hope that doesn't sound raw to the teachers because I'm a teacher and I'm all for giving people consequences. I'm all for it. There's value in it. I'm in favor of church discipline. Certainly, if there's someone who doesn't value harmony in the church, you ought to go to him privately to make things right. If that doesn't work out, take two or three elders and go and try to make it right. If that doesn't work out, call the whole church together and put pressure on him to be reconciled, if it doesn't work out, then remove him from membership in your church. That is, it's an issue of church discipline whether you're willing to harmonize with your brethren. I I don't mean to believe just what they believe, but I'm talking about as far as injuries and hurts, that kind of experience. It's an issue according to Matthew 18. So I believe in judgment, in discipline, Well, how does that match what I'm saying about love? Maybe I should show that to you. It's not in my notes, so I hope I can find it well. Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, and I'm just going to look while you are turning there. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 2 is a follow-up passage after 1 Corinthians 1 invited the church of Corinth to disfellowship a certain sinful man. What had that sinful man done? He had had an affair with his stepmother. That's what he had done. And that was a level of depravity that was below average for the local Roman pagans. So it was a shame for the church. It was just a terrible thing but the church had gotten a misunderstanding of grace and there were some of them thinking that we're the church of grace and hey, we can have grace even for this. And Paul had said in the first book, that person needs to be separated from your company. That needs to happen. Well, they got the message and they did it. He was disfellowshipped. And here in chapter two is the follow-up letter about that experience. Let's look in verse five. But if any have caused grief, he has not grieved me but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Verse 6, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. It's talking about that man from 1 Corinthians. Did he receive a punishment? He did. Was it done by the church elder or the church pastor or was it a group process? Do you see there in verse 6? Did the pastor disfellowship him or was it done by the body? You can see it there in verse six, can't you? It says it was inflicted of many. Verse seven, oh, verse six said that was sufficient. That was enough punishment what happened to him. Verse seven, so that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. What is he saying? He said when you disfellowshipped him, that you don't need to follow up that by being mean and cold to him. It's not needed. You can be as warm and friendly as you ever have been. In fact, when Jesus said, treat them as a heathen and a publican, well, pray tell, how are you supposed to treat heathen and publicans? 
nice or meanly? Especially nice. And that's what he's saying here. He said he was punished enough. You separated him from your fellowship. Now you need to go talk to that man. Let him know you care. Look at the next verse. He says, wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward who? Toward him. There are many parents that don't understand the principle of mercy here. This is how mercy and justice go together in parenting. It's not that when they're good, you give them ice cream and, and praise them, and when they're bad, you spank them and treat them like they're little brats and have a grudge against them for two hours, that's not right. The right way, oh, will I get in trouble in New Zealand for this? Anyway, here it goes. The right way is to have a sit down with that disobedient young man, let him know that his disobedience is hurtful to himself and to you, let him know that it it must not continue, and consequently to help him remember, you're going to inflict pain on him to let him know that you don't hate him or even you're not even angry at him. Make sure you're not angry when you say it. You shouldn't be angry when you talk to someone about something like this. If you're angry, wait till later. You can't be angry when you do this. And then let him know you're going to cause him some pain as an effort to help him and then cause him some pain. Preferably on the hind end. I'm not saying you smack him in the face or you, you know nothing like that ever. But you shouldn't be angry. You shouldn't be out of control. When you end up giving him his punishment, then the model you just read here in 2 Corinthians 2 is that's a good time to confirm your what? It's a good time to confirm your love. To let him know that you certainly do care, you still care, you do care. And if we disciplined that way, I know it would work out better than the two options that are normal. The two normal options are A, just never ever spank and just let them get away with things until you're just so angry that you scream at them and tell them, don't! I'll kill you if you do that again. Of course, we don't mean it. We're not gonna do it. But we scream and they realize they don't wanna do it and, and they stop for a while. That's one method. The other method is when they do something wrong, we stop them, we blow our top, and we're angry while we hit them. You know, both of these, A and B, produce rebellion. They both create deep-seated, angry rebellion. B is a little more tricky that way. If you're very consistent in your angry, painful punishment, you could create well-regulated soldiers for a few years but somewhere around 16, 17, or 18, the mirage of you having a good family is going to disappear, and they're gonna look like a bunch of crazy runaway kids. I mean, they're just gonna burst all bonds. But don't kid yourself, they didn't become rebellious at 17. They were rebellious at seven. They were just afraid to show it. What I'm trying to say is that the Bible presents a program of discipline that is very effective. Oh, let me honor my father for a minute. My father, I don't expect to see him in heaven. He never persisted or tried to live a life of faith as far as I can tell. He was an addict to sin and several types of sins all through his life as long as he could be. But my father got discipline right. He got it right. He did it properly. And it made it easier for me to submit to the Lord Jesus when I came to understand what was true and best. I think here in New Zealand, if parents got the discipline thing right, correct, if I had to choose between A and B, I don't even know if, I think I would just panic and ask for another choice. They're just both so terrible. I'm just pleading with any parent who sees this to recognize that what your children need is love and correction, not one at one time, one at the other. They need them both at the same time. They need them together. Parents, yes, teachers also. Teachers, it's not right that you treat the obedient scholars as if they're your best friends and the irritating scholars as if they're your enemies. It isn't right. You just have no idea what you're doing when you do that. You're making a big mess for yourself. 
those students that are a little irritating have such potential with proper instruction and warmth and kindness why they even crave, they will never tell you this, but they crave warm-hearted discipline. That's what they crave. That's what they hunger for is a little bit of warm-hearted control and consequences and love that follows punishment. But what they often get is they get ignored, 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 harsh! And you know, it doesn't do it for them. So I've maybe talked about this long enough. I hope that someone understands. Merciful thinking we talked about it already, but let's remember again Luke 22, 30, Luke 22, 34. I think that's where it is. Let's look it up because I'm not sure that's exactly the right place. But I think that's where Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. I'm feeling nervous that won't be the right place. Oh, well, that's not the right place. So I don't know where it is, but you know it's in the Bible anyway, don't you? Jesus, oh, it's, it's 2334. What you had there is just bad handwriting that got the best of me. Luke 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Did they know they were killing him? Well, they knew that. Did the leaders know that they weren't following the protocol of Moses properly? They knew that much, for sure. Did they know that they had never caught him doing anything really wrong? Yeah. I guess I'm saying that there were lots of things that they knew. But Jesus, right here he's actually speaking out the soldiers that are parting his garments. Jesus wasn't inclined to remind the Father of how guilty people are. He really was trying to do it a different way. He was trying to excuse them. And you might be thinking, no, he's not trying to excuse people. That's not the way Jesus is. But I'm telling you, yes, it is. Look at Romans 11. Romans 11. We're going to look at verse 32. Romans 11 and verse 32. It says, for God has concluded them all, that is the Hebrews, in unbelief. Why would he say they were all unbelieving? Notice what it says. For the purpose so that he could have mercy upon all. Maybe that's a curious idea to you. Let me explain it to you. Back in Numbers, it's in Numbers 15, God addressed the question of presumptuous sin what to do when someone knows what's right, they just brave the consequences and they go and do the thing that they know they shouldn't do. Adultery is that way, by the way. When you're married and you commit adultery, that's a presumptuous sin. You know. That's why the Bible treats it so strongly. Presumptuous sin in Numbers 15, there's no sacrifice for presumptuous sin. When a man just goes forward like that and does what he knows he shouldn't do, God says he needs to be cut off from his people. In Numbers 15, when that happens, that when that command is given, in the very next verse, they catch an Egyptian man who is disregarding the Sabbath command openly and flagrantly. He's picking up sticks, getting ready, to pick, gathering wood for a fire. And they arrest him and they go to God and ask, what should be done with this man? And God's answer is, in that particular case, is that he should be stoned. Well, you might say, what? Is breaking the Sabbath something to be stoned for? Oh, let me tell you, it's not about the Sabbath. It's about presumptuous sin. It's about fragrant, fragrant rebellion. It almost sounds like good smelling rebellion. I think I'll just say, it, it's about serious rebellion. That kind of, that's what John speaks of when he says there's a sin that is unto death. I do not say you should pray for it. It's that, presumptuous sin. It, that is a serious thing. When you're interceding for people, you really aren't praying that God will like let them into heaven as they are. Th that's really not the nature of intercessory prayer. 
What you're praying is that God will extend more period of mercy and peace to them so that they have an opportunity to make things right, just so you understand what we're praying for. So here in Romans 11, God could relate to the Jews as if they're stubborn, stiff-necked rebels. That is, he could treat what they're doing wrong as if it was presumptuous. But if he did, they would end up sending away their day of grace in short order. I mean, it wouldn't take long for you and I to be hopelessly lost if every time we did something when we knew better, God treated us as if we were in open rebellion. So what does the Lord Jesus do as judge of the earth? He, we, he doesn't owe it to us, but out of great kindness, he says, they don't really understand. They don't really believe what I've said about how serious this is. They don't really believe how solemn and how deep are these commands. He counts us as if we're in depths of unbelief. And why does he do it? To give us mercy. To give us more time. Let me show this to you elsewhere because maybe it's kind of foggy to you. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. When you see the word Christ, you might want to try this for a week or two. You might want to try replacing that word with Messiah. Because when you use the phrase Jesus Christ all your life, you can begin in your mind to relate to the word Christ as if it's part of his name, when really it's not his name, it's his title. And it, just to save yourself from misunderstanding, you might just want to say Jesus the Messiah or the Messiah Jesus. I'm not telling you you have to do that, but just that when you see Christ, that's what it means. The, the anointed one, the Savior. Verse 13, or verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful and put me into the ministry. Look at verse 13. Who previously was a blasphemer and a persecutor, and I hurt God's cause on the planet. I was injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it, what does he say? Ignorantly in unbelief. Why did he receive mercy? That's the kind way God related to it. I mean, God didn't have to treat him that way. He certainly had access to some light. Paul had lived at the same time as Jesus. He had been alive at the same time Jesus was on earth. He heard stories and he had some access so if God was interested in catching him in guiltiness, a case could have been made against him. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? There could have been made a case, this evil, injurious, blasphemous crook, he turned away from the light. Whenever it shone his way, he looked a different way. He doesn't deserve any more chances. God could have done that, but he didn't. God was looking for a way to be merciful so he said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And that showed the ignorance because Saul said back to him, who are you, Lord? You remember that? Look at verse 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus the Messiah might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Did you know that God chose Paul to help you? That God chose Paul first, a man who was very, very naughty, and he chose him first and showed him mercy. And what was the purpose of that? To encourage you when you feel, realize how naughty you've been. That's what it was for, is to end up showing you that he can show mercy that's why he got it. Isn't that beautiful? Mercy is beautiful. It's about as beautiful as things get. You it might even say 
Maybe you've heard it as a song, Micah 6, 8. He hath showed you, O man, what is good. And what does God require of you? But to do justly, that's the Ten Commandments. What's after that? And to love mercy. We could have a whole sermon also on what it means to walk humbly with your God, but I'm talking right now about mercy. Do you see in Micah 6, 8, it's required? that God wants us to live in a way that makes his mercy apparent to others. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine is where Jesus first sends out the 12 disciples. Someone asked me off camera recently whether I send my students out to do mission work in twos. And I said I send them out singly to labor. And I could see in the eyes of the someone a thought like, but, but Jesus said by twos. Well, I just want to show you some things here. Luke chapter nine and verse one. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, not a stave nor a scrip. Don't take bread nor money, neither have two coats apiece. And into whatever house you enter into, stay in that house and stay there until you depart. From thence depart is what that means. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. What does it say here in Luke 9? It doesn't say anything about two and two, so let me finish that thought and then get back to Luke 9. Jesus sent the disciples two to a city, not two to a door but they were two in a city so that they wouldn't get into despair. They could meet together often for prayer and encouragement to help each other out. They might have worked actually together sometimes, but they could get more done working on their own, but they needed someone to be there as a support. And he sent them out by twos, not forever, but for a short time to come back. It was part of their training. But you notice here in Luke 9, what kind of resources did he send them with? Very little resources. Like when I was reading this to you, I was thinking about what I brought with me. I brought with me a scrip, two coats, and bread and money. Almost everything prohibited here I brought with me. Why did he send them without these things? Oh, you know, it worked out. I tried this for several years. I just decided to just live on donations. I lived that way for five years. Partly I live that way even now. And I'll tell you, it just worked out. Never lacked anything. I wasn't employed by anybody. But I found that when Jesus sends you out, he also makes sure, he doesn't make sure you have a mansion, but he makes sure you have nutrition and that you have clothes. That's what he makes sure. And if you have that, you can be content. So he sent out the 12 here in chapter nine. Look now to chapter 10. Chapter 10 is where he sends out the 70. Luke chapter 10, and we'll start in verse, 10, verse one. After these things, the Lord appeared, appointed other 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So do you see that the 70 were doing groundwork for Jesus? They were doing prep work. Uh, I have worked with Amazing Facts for a while and uh, helping them start schools around the planet and I wore myself out that way and that's why I had to stop. But um, what I found is that many people go into a city to try to attract people to the gospel without doing any previous groundwork there. And I just want you to see here in Luke 10, that's not the model that Jesus followed. That Jesus, before he went to the city, he sent some people there to be working. 
and they were doing medical missionary work. That is medical and missionary. They were helping people where it counts, physically helping them spiritually, meeting their needs. That's the work they were doing. Then Jesus came later. I think it's a good system, but let's read on verse two. Therefore he said unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Also I must preach about verse two. You might imagine it, but it's not so that Jesus said, the laborers are few, therefore work 24 seven. Is that what he said? Jesus never laid a heavy burden on a man. He never laid a heavy burden on someone. If you have a heavy burden, you probably picked it up as a volunteer. But Jesus said, my burden is light. You know, it's easy. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. I don't mean that it's just a breeze to do the work of God. Sure, there is labor, there's work, there's stress, but it's not crushing. You could do it year after year, year after year, from the time you start working to the time you need to retire, you could do it the whole time and you'd be okay. But some people take on work that isn't at that level. Do you know anyone who takes on work at a higher level than that? If you take on work at a higher level, what you end up doing is robbing the future for the present. You end up wearing yourself out and then you can't do anything. So let me just preach and say, that according to Jesus, if you don't see enough laborers in New Zealand, the solution is not overwork, it's more prayer. What you're praying for is not that you'll be able to recruit more workers, but that he'll send more workers. I don't mean that you shouldn't try to recruit them. Please do. But I mean you can't take that burden on you. If there aren't enough workers, you can't blame yourself for that. What's the prayer? You're asking him to send forth more laborers into the field. That's his work to send the laborers. While Jesus was here, there were no laborers for India or Malaysia or New Zealand. There just weren't enough. So he just covered Judea because that's what he could man. And that's what he could cover well. Luke chapter 10, looking at verse 3. Go your way, he said to the 70. Part of me wants to preach on that too, but I won't take long. One of the biggest hindrances to winning souls is not getting started. One of the biggest hindrances to helping people learn the truth for this time is making plans about how to do it. I don't mean an hour of planning, but I mean planning, meetings, planning, meetings, planning, meetings, meetings, planning, planning, meetings, meetings, planning, trainings, planning, training, training, planning, planning, training, training, planning, planning, praying, praying, but not ever doing anything. That is just a mess. That's kind of like someone who just eats and 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 thinks they're gonna get muscles, right? So what did he say? Go your ways. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes. Salute no man by the way. And into whatever house you enter, first say peace be to this house. You know, it's the same thing he said to the 12. Jesus sent the 70 without anything. Now, when you get to the very last day of Jesus' life, I mean his life on earth as a mortal, when you get to the last day of that life, he doesn't have time to talk about everything, but he does review a few things. Let's look there. Look at Luke 22. This is how I had that sneaking suspicion. I had the Ron verse earlier because I knew what was in Luke 22, and, uh, and it just didn't seem like they could be in the same place. Luke 22 and verse 35. Luke 22, verse 35. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, did you lack anything? What do they say? How'd it go? Pretty well, right? They had everything they needed. 
But notice the strange answer, 36. Then he said to them, But now he that has a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. What in the world? Jesus, who said, turn the other cheek, the lover of John the Baptist, who John the Baptist said to the soldiers, do violence to no man. Jesus, who taught John in Revelation that he that lives by the sword must die by the sword, pray tell why is he telling them to buy one? I think the answer is right here in Luke 22. Look back just a little earlier. Look up at verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. We're gonna come back to these verses in our next session. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day before you shall thrice deny that you know me. Look down at verse 36, or excuse me, at verse 37. And I, and I say unto you that that which is written shall yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things about me have an end. When you read the other gospels, you see that right here, it wasn't just Peter that was told that he was going to abandon Jesus. Jesus said to all 12 disciples, you're going to abandon me tonight. Here's how I understand this. Jesus said, when you were serving me, I took care of you. I watched your back. I fed you. I clothed you. When you were working for me, you had everything you needed. But tonight you're going to abandon me. You're going to leave my service. And when you leave my service, I can't protect you the same way I've been doing. It's a dangerous world out there. There are mortal enemies. Make sure you have money. Make sure you have health. Make sure you have a sword. Take good care of yourself. Or what it means to me, my wife and I don't have life insurance. We don't need life insurance. I don't say to the, to the unbeliever he shouldn't have it. I don't say to the unbeliever that he shouldn't keep a gun under his pillow, although I do think it's not very smart. It's more likely that his kid will accidentally shoot someone than it is he'll kill a thief. But anyway, I don't tell him how to protect himself because he doesn't have the protection I have. But I'll say to you, while you're in the service of God, you don't need the sword and you don't need the revolver. What you really need is to serve Jesus faithfully. All I've been saying in this period, really, it's two simple ideas. The first idea is that God's amazing mercy treats people more mercifully than you would expect to treat them. And that if we let it into the inside, it will really convert people. People will be amazed when they see the mercy, it'll drive them away from their foolish, self-serving, lust-serving, deceitful, angry, murderous ways. If we let it on the inside. On the contrary, if we hold them just as accountable as we think they ought to be held, if we talk to them or re relate to them as if they're just guilty, stubborn people, shame on you, the trouble is that with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. So in our daily prayer, we're gonna pray, Lord, forgive me, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Then we're gonna talk to our debtors as if we forgive them. And in the process of doing this kind of work, we're going to be missionaries of the real type, the kind that showcase Jesus and his love, and it just works. Personally, publicly, it works. I love the mercy of Jesus.